So this is a quick down and dirty exam for review for my students, but this is going to quickly cover anaphylactic shock, septic shock, lupus, burns, and um, uh, acute kidney injury and chronic renal failure. So if these are topics you're studying, this might be an interest to you, but this is definitely for my students for exam for review. So let's get started. So acute kidney injury, AKI, we see with a lot of patients because dehydration, excessive bleeding, vomiting, and diarrhea can cause AKI. Think about how many things can cause vomiting and diarrhea to an excess, right? Or dehydration um, for other reasons. And excessive bleeding, that would deal with traumas um, where we have bleeding out or surgeries where a patient has bled out. So just remember with AKI, if you look at all those signs and symptoms, the number one cause for AKI is hypovolemia. We're losing volume through either sweating um, or some for reason why dehydration has been caused due to vomiting, diarrhea, excessive bleeding. So a volume loss is the biggest for AKI because when we lose a lot of volume, our kidneys are not able to filter. They're going to start to shut themselves down. And when we do that, we'll see a, an injury to the kidney. Um, always remember your lab values for AKI. AKI. We look at BUN and creatinine. So we're looking at renal function. And just remember, both are going to elevate, but creatinine is telling us the creatine breakdown in our system. And because of that, creatinine is the major lab that we're going to want to look at when we're looking at AKI. So if that is elevated and wherever it is, then we need to um, make sure that we are looking at those lab values. Um, signs and symptoms of AKI. Um, there are different but what happens is, is first of all, they're going to have um, decrease, they can have a decrease in urinary output. They can have some other things, but if we're not filtering, and that is what we're looking at, if we're not filtering correctly, what are we doing? We're holding on to toxins and waste, right? We're unable to get the toxic byproduct in our body out because that's what our renals and our GI tract does, right? Our waste comes out through urine and feces. So if we're unable to do that, what happens? Well, we'll start to have a toxic buildup. And when we have a toxic buildup, we can see uremic encephalopathy, meaning confusion, lethargy, those things. If you've ever dealt with a renal patient, someone with uh, renal failure or acute uh, renal failure or kidney injury, you can start to see those things. And the reason why is, is we've got you, uh, the toxins are building up within our system that usually are the byproduct that we, we pass through urine. They're in our system just circulating through and it can cause an encephalopathy. And so that causes that confusion. They can become combative, but they're neurological symptoms that we see. So um, that is what happens, unfortunately. And then if they, if we don't fix the situation and we keep going on and they get to the end stage and we end up can't not reversing because we can reverse AKI. When we can't reverse it, it goes to chronic renal failure. When we get there, what do we do? These people will have this and then they'll have to be dialyzed, right? So then they go to dialysis. Um, sometimes we'll even dialyze an AKI if it's severe and um, once or twice just to get them through and over the hump to where they can get better. Um, go ahead and review for my students your different phases of AKI. There's the oliguric phase, the diuresis phase, and the recovery phase. Um, they're very thorough in the lectures, in that lecture that I provided for you um, 
on AKI. So just go through, I think the slides even really have all the notes for you. So just uh, go through, get those phases. They're important to understand because they're time framed in the signs and symptoms. But um, definitely get that information for yourselves. Um, and remember, remember, remember as nurses, do not give nephrotoxic medications without questioning them with the doctor or the practitioner. So just remember um, the kidneys are our filter, one of our major filters, right? And so if we are in injury, or failure we do not need to be given medications and what do we want to do one of the major medications that you need to be concerned about that we give a lot and people go oh it's okay it's a it'll be fine and that is um, toradol or catoradol right it's one of those meds so if your creatinine is greater than 1.2 we do not give um, those nephrotoxic medications, especially Toradol. And the reason why is all you're going to do is cause this patient to have more failure. You're just going to shut their kidneys down even further or cause more injury. And we don't want to do that. So what we need to do is if a nephrotoxic medication is ordered, you always want to look at your creatinine and BUN, definitely your creatinine, and then let your provider know that they have one greater than 1.2 and that you're concerned about that because of the situation and let them make the decision. And if they decide to give it because the medicine outweighs the, the bad, then um, you just make sure you document that because you have questioned for the patient, you critically thought that through. Most of the time what will happen is providers will go, oh, I didn't realize that, okay, no worries, let's give them this and they'll give you something else. So just a thought, if you have someone that's been in AKI, but their creatinine is down a little, you still might want to go ahead and let the physician or provider know that they've been in there. So always be questioning those things because you don't want to cause more harm. And that's all. And I'm going to tell you, we're all in it together, including the provider and the, the physician. And they're not going to look at you like you're questioning. Don't go and say, hey, by the way. But just say, hey, I just wanted to make you aware that creatinine is 1.4 this morning. I didn't know if you were aware of that. And so, and we've ordered Toradol. And, you know, they'll they'll think it through and they'll, they'll give you what you need. But you've done what you're supposed to do as the nurse. So let's take a look at chronic renal failure or CRF. Sometimes you'll see it written like that in notes. Um, always remember whenever you're looking at any of your exemplars or any disease or any patient, what am I going to do as the nurse, right? Those are the things. Go back and look at that. What do you do for chronic renal failure patients? Um, also safety for our chronic renal fa uh, failure patients. Um, one of the first signs of chronic renal failure is nocturia. Is that a safety issue? Yes, it is a safety issue. We get concerned because, <coughs> excuse me, because the patient's having to get up in the night and go to the bathroom. We're disoriented. Do we want throw, rug, throw rugs? No. We need to make sure there's a low light that people can see. They don't trip. They don't fall. But the reason behind the nocturia with chronic renal failure, and it's one of the beginning signs, the first signs, is because the kidneys cannot concentrate. So how our kidneys filter is so important that you understand. So when we're filtering correctly, we concentrate, the kidneys will concentrate and pull what it needs to out, urine, and then the urine is formed and we urinate. But what happens with failure where it's not doing what it's supposed to do, we can't concentrate that urine. And so we start to have nocturia. We have, you know, um, frequent urination, nocturia, those things. But those are the first signs of chronic or early signs of chronic renal failure. Um, erythropoietin is a medication you need to know. We give it for different reasons, but it's definitely a medication that we see with chronic renal failure. Um, it's given to treat anemia. So any like cancers, other um, disease processes, 
processes out there that cause um, anemia. A lot of patients will get erythropoietin, but we give this to chronic renal failure patients. And so all of those that you have, which are a lot of people out there in the world, you'll see as you come across them as patients, um, they're going to be anemic. And it's what it is, is, is the kidneys are... Um, are unable to produce the hormone that pr that creates red blood cells and we naturally make it it's in the slides go back and look at that but erythropoietin is a medicine we give for anemia and what it does is it stimulates the red blood cell production and so that is so important if we don't have enough red blood cells what happens we don't have enough oxygen carrying capacity for our body right so they're not going to um, oxygenate well. They're not going to have those things. So erythropoietin is a great drug to know. Make a drug card and go ahead and read through it and understand why we give it to chronic renal failure patients. Um, I put this with star, 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 because anybody that cannot concentrate and filter and is having trouble um, doing those things, you need to restrict fluids. This uh, chronic renal failure patients are not patients that we give tons of fluid to. Now, in AKI, you're going to give fluids at one point. And so go back and look at that in the different phases. But with chronic renal failure, the kidneys aren't functioning. They're not able to process the fluid on board. If you give them a ton of fluid, they're going to overload. And you can overload the heart, you know, causing them to have respiratory distress. You can, you know, um, heart, uh, major heart issues, failure, and then also swelling and edema. So we need to restrict fluids. And I'm going to say this to you. It's very sad because people want, when you say you can't have something, what do you want? You want it, right? Number one. Number two, they're thirsty. They want to drink. They're dry, but they can't have the fluid so you have to explain it to them and it's 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 hard it's hard for them um i've had chronic renal failure patients you know drinking out of the bathrooms and so you just have to be very very um strict with that and explain it to them but also have empathy towards them but it doesn't mean give them fluids restrict 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 your fluids um thrill in a brewery if they have access you should be able to um fill a thrill and hear a brewery fill a thrill and so if it's fluctuating because it's arterial and venous blood that's is you know uh you've they've connected that together so you get this pulsating um access that's under their skin you know it's their part of their body it's it is their lifeline that's what we dialyze through you should always be able when you're doing your assessment you take put your hand don't push down you don't need to just lay your hand softly over um the area and you should be able to feel the thrill and you'll know what i mean when you feel it it's like it's pulsating it's turbulent it's like in a river when uh, one comes to the other it becomes very t turbulent and rough that's what happens when you get uh, venous and arterial blood and they kind of mix together there um, and a brewery you're going to hear so you'll take your stethoscope uh, and uh, put it over and you'll hear it so always assess that if you have a patient and you're looking at them say they're unconscious or they're sedated and you see that you always want to assess a thrill in a brewery and also never access it, never stick that arm, never stick that site because you will destroy their access and that is their lifeline once again. Um, and dialysis, that is our ticket, guys. We dialyze these patients. Dialysis is very cumbersome. It can cause emotional distress for these patients, but that is what we do to actually clean the blood, right? It filters out pulls what's necessary dialysis is the human kidney outside of the body and we need to do it to and some people go three times a week some people go it once a week just depending on where they are and what's going on with those kidneys so let's talk about burns so of course there is a lecture for you gather your notes from that 
Remember, our fluid resuscitation is vital for survival. You have to resuscitate. The Parkland formula is the formula we use to calculate how much fluid or volume. Remember, it always starts from the, the time of injury. So if you don't get them to the hospital and it's been two hours, let's say, you still have to calculate because the amount of fluid that's calculated by the Parkland formula starts from the time of injury. You are to give it within eight hours, but if two hours have already gone by from that time of injury, that means you have six hours to get the eight hours worth of fluid in. I hope that makes sense for everyone. But do your Parkland formula. Um, remember, we do rule of nines is uh, the body surface area. We're calculating a percentage of burn, and that's we program that in to say this is how much fluid. And lactated ringers is our fluid of choice for burns always. Um, when we're just hanging up stuff for patients or we're giving LR is our friend. And the reason why is the lactate buffers. Um, when you burn, there is all of the uh, body fluids and um, uh, is released due to the injury of the tissue and because of that it can cause metabolic acidosis and so what we want to make sure is that we do LR and the lactate in the LR those lactate ringers they can buffer that and hopefully prevent metabolic acidosis so just go back through looking at that understanding remember that burns um, they are going to lose tons of volume. They're losing the skin. And what does skin, our largest organ, do? It protects the body. It pre prevents hypothermia. It prevents infection. It keeps fluids in where they're supposed to be. When we've damaged that and destroyed it to a burn, um, we've got to understand that. So what are we going to do? We're going to give fluids. We're going to give lots of fluids based on the Parkland formula. Parkland formula and rule of nines, looking at that body surface area of burns. And then we're going to keep them warm. We're going to use warm blankets, warm LR. We're going to um, up the thermostat because they're going to be losing temperature. And what happens when you get cold? You shiver, right? The body's trying to maintain homeostasis and keep that temperature. And so what, what happens to the body is, and then what do you do when you shiver? Well, you burn more energy. Does someone who is so compromised need to be burning more energy? No, not at all. And as you'll see is with burn patients, as they go on, the caloric intake is vital for healing. And so as days go into this, the nutritionist and dietitian will come in and will um, understand those things. Also saying that, not on burns, but thinking back to kidney, just remember, what is it that um, dietary, you know, we need to make sure they're going to have high potassium levels. They're going to have high different uh, levels with kidney function issues. For burns, they're going to need calories and protein those things. So just go back, always review, thinking about as the nurse, what do I need to think? When you are thinking as a nurse, you are thinking safety, you are thinking medicines, you are thinking diet, exercise. Um, if it's to protect them from anything, that is your job. That is what a nurse does. And you have to critically think it through. So I always think system wise, what do I need to worry about? Can they get an infection from this? Can they, can it shut down more organs? Can it cause them to, um, burn more energy? You know, we're trying to save their life. And in doing so, we need to think this way. And then down the road, when we're in recovery of things, we need to make sure that we um, provide what's needed and that it's happening. You are, the, you are the patient advocate. You are there for them. And you are that person. Just remember that. And everybody else, it takes a village to do this. You need respiratory therapists, physical therapists, occupational doctors, uh, you know, radiology. You've got to have it all. But the bottom line, guys, is the nurse is the one that's there with the patient standing, making sure this person comes, this person comes, that person comes, but the care is being provided. So that's just go back through your burns. This kind of guides you in a little bit so that you can um, understand. 
so there wasn't really a lecture. I think I might have put a um, video lecture up for you, but if not, I did do a PowerPoint. It's under the classroom folder if my students didn't get it. Um, but lupus, lupus is one of your um, exemplars and there are test questions for them for this. Just remember lupus is an autoimmune disorder. It can cause inflammation in various organ systems such as skin, joints, and kidneys. Um, it's systemic. When we talk about autoimmune disorders, any of them, they're most of them are systemic, meaning they're going to affect multiple organs. So lupus is one. Um, how do we diagnose lupus? Just remember, we do an anti-nuclear antibody test. Um, it's an they, You'll hear it called out in the real world, ANA test. And that is the test that tells us if a patient has lupus. So what we do is we draw blood, it goes out, and then they're going to look. And when they're studying that, the blood will do different things because what do autoimmune disorders do? What is autoimmune? It's going to attack our immune system, right? And because of that, we'll see, and they can tell if they have lupus. That and signs and symptoms. Look at your signs and symptoms of lupus. What is the classic sign of lupus? The butterfly rash across the face, goes across the bridge of the nose and the cheeks. When we see that, it's we usually go ahead and start testing and thinking this person is probably has lupus. The other thing with autoimmune disorders, just an FYI, -er, is that lots of times people might have rheumatoid or something like that. And they need to be tested for other autoimmune disorders because sometimes they'll go hand in hand. So you might have lupus and RA. I have a good friend that has both. And, um, and so it's kind of an interesting thing. But autoimmune, there's a lot out there that we're seeing fibromyalgia, different things where the system, our bodies are pretty much attacking our own immune system. And that makes it very difficult. So what do we have to do? We give them immu immunosuppressive medications to suppress that autoimmune response, right? So when we do that, what are we doing? We're lowering the immune system. We're lowering, trying to get the, where the body won't attack itself. But when we lower an immune system, what are we doing to these patients? We're making them prevalent or have the ability to take on and get sick. They're the ones that will get sick very quickly. So when COVID came out, here's a perfect example. Anybody that had autoimmune disorders were at a very, very, very high risk of contracting or getting COVID. And because of all the comorbidities and things that go on with the system, um, they were ones that were at risk to really be sick. So let's talk about anaphylactic shock. Okay, so the shocks we will go even further into when we get to perfusion for my class, but for anaphylactic shock, remember epinephrine is your drug of choice. That is what we give. You need to know the dose. There is a difference between the cardiac epi that we give, um, like in a code situation, and the um, epinephrine that we give for anaphylaxis. So go back and review that. Um, remember your signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis. So what is the number one? What do we worry about? We see a patient and they have hives, right? Hives all over their body. If you have eye hives, urticaria, if you have that, that is something that we're very concerned about because then it can continue into where we have itching and closing of the throat, the feeling that they cannot swallow, those things. And that becomes an airway. They're compromising airway. But urticaria and hives are usually the first thing we see. They're itching, they're all those things. So go back and look at your signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis, anaphylactic shock, and just remember that. Um, somebody said, oh my gosh, a little boy, I've eaten peanuts and I didn't know peanuts was in that, you know, something at school. And um, I'm allergic to peanuts. The, what do you want to do? You're going to you're going to look up there. You're going to lift up that little shirt and look and see, do they have hives on their body? And, you know, ask them, how do you how is your throat feeling OK or whatever? And then you're going to treat them. And the other thing is, is always anybody that has severe allergies uh, that they are prevalent to anaphylaxis, 
or anaphylactic shock, they need to be wearing a medical ID and they should always be carrying an epi auto injector at all times. Now at school for smaller children, the teacher needs to be aware and the nurse needs to be aware, school nurse. But for adults or children that are old enough that can accept the responsibility of taking care of themselves, um, medical ID is so important and also the epi auto injector so that they can give themselves a shot immediately if they get stung by a bee or if they eat shellfish by accident. Um, very, very scary. Two incidents since this big um, hurricane came through our area. We had a firefighter who is severely allergic to bee stings, got stung by a bee. Um, he came in and was able um, to get uh, some medicine um, and then also, and he did fine. And we also had another firefighter who was cutting a family out of a home and ended up entangled in poison, ivy poison oak, one of the two, but he's highly, highly allergic to both. Um, he came in and we ended up giving a steroid injection and uh, other stuff and also gave him some um, nasal epi to take with him in case he started to have anaphylaxis and we checked on him again and he did fine so there are things that happen but make sure you're informing your patient to wear that at all times and nowadays the medical id stuff you can get kind of pretty it can look kind of pretty, the jewelry, so it's important. And just remember that different allergens, I mean, some people are allergic to, you never know, you know what I mean? But it's not just, but our prevalent ones that we see are shellfish, peanuts, um, things like that, uh, bee stings, stuff like that, uh, po and plants, poison ivy, poison oak, stuff anything like that those are the ones that we normally see um, but there are other people that can be very allergic to very rare things and so that's even more important that they identify that but just go back through review your epinephrine um, what it is what it does and all of that and your signs and symptoms so last but not least septic shock so remember signs and symptoms of shock um, and, and sepsis, septic shock and sepsis. Um, early signs of septic shock, the patient often gets warm and flushed first because they're gonna vasodilate. Everything just gonna open up and to increase, um, uh, to try to perfuse. That's what the body's going to try to do is perfuse. Then as we progress with septic shock, we're gonna become cold and clammy. So, and the reason why is everything's starting to shut down. Um, the, the main reasons behind or treating of septic shock is always volume, and antibiotics because sepsis is caused by an infection, right? It's become systemic. We then have all of these symptoms start to happen, but it is definitely can um, kill your patients. So we need to make sure we're on top of it, giving those fluids and antibiotics. Um, review mods, that's multi-organ. And what happens is, is with septic shock, we're not perfusing, we're not oxygenating and perfusing the major organs so they all start to fail but go back through and just review i think it's a one slide thing that i gave you but um that is what happens it's multi-organ dysfunction and failure um and then lactic uh, acid we test our lab is lactic acid for sepsis or septic shock why because a serum or a blood lactate level it's obtained because it's going to tell us what the oxygen status of the body is. And what happens is it elevates when we're hypoxic. So um, when we don't have enough perfusion and oxygenation in the body, our lactic levels will elevate. So we always get one if we're concerned about our patients or we're wondering, are they septic? If that's the case, we'll do a lactic level. If it's elevated, then we know, right? That's how we can know. Um, uh, severe conditions with the uh, sepsis, uh, heart failure, any tissue injury, um, that's where we're not getting the perfusion. We're going to look at a lactate level.
So that's the reason behind that. And the body, when we're not oxygenating, will start to, things will start to break down and then lactic acid builds up in our system. And so that's why we look at that and it will tell us. We need to know the level and as it comes down, it's normal, as it starts to normalize, we know things are getting better. If it continues to rise, things are getting worse. So labs for septic shock, let's look at that lactate level. Now you're going to look at everything. You want to look at a white blood cell count. We're going to look at, um, so a CBC, we want to see our H and H. We want to know that. We're going to look at our chemistry panel. We want to know what is our kidneys doing? What's our creatinine and our BUN? All of those things are affected when we're in a shock state because the body cannot, it's trying to perfuse, but it's failing. If we don't reverse it and get things changed around, it'll keep going until the body can't compensate anymore. And then, and that's where we get the mods. That's where we get where the organs are shutting down. When that happens, the, we are, we are dying. The body is dying. The patient is dying and we need to be intervening quickly. We're actually behind the eight ball, so we need to be doing what we need to do to hopefully get it reversed and start to get them better. So um, go back through your septic shock. There is lecture on that, and um, know those those things. I hope that this will help for my students. This should help you gather information, get your notes together for this exam coming. Um, we have been through in our area, unfortunately, Hurricane Helene um, did a lot of damage in our area. I'm still without power. Um, so we are preparing, trying to continue with nursing school and getting done what we need to get done. So for all those out there, I hope this helps. For my students, I hope this will help organize your thought, get your notes together. That's going to help you. Have your ATI book. Um, and when you find your answers, make sure you highlight or um, write out uh, for yourselves so that you will be able to study further and know as you move forward. And just so FYI for my students, when we get to perfusion and I teach cardio, cardiogenic and neurogenic shock, um, you will be tested on all shocks again just FYI. So anyway, I hope this helps. I hope everybody is well and um, just be safe out there, folks, and study hard. You can do this. We need great practicing, safe practicing nurses. And I know all my students are going to get there and I want everybody else to get there that's on this journey.